Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are back in the Gospel of Mark, and you may have forgotten all about that since it's been a month since we have been studying this book, but uh, that means we need to do just a bit of review of where we have been the past few weeks before. And uh, the, we've been studying Mark chapter 13, which is the Olivet Discourse. It is the Lord's instruction to his disciples about the future and about his coming. He first described the general signs which are occurring in the age in which we live. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, disturbances of various kinds. We're living in that age now. But then as he goes on in the discourse, he narrows things uh, to a very specific focus of specific signs uh, that would immediately precede his return. The abomination of desolation, cosmic disturbances like the, the sun being darkened and stars falling, that kind of thing. So that brings us to the near conclusion of this discourse, which is our passage, verses 28 to 37, which involves two parables and some exhortations. The Lord says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When, it, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming whether in the evening at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. One of the first decisions parents make is the name they choose for their child. And each generation, it seems, has certain names that are popular. I think it's always been that way. I know it was in the early church. Two names that Christians like to call their sons were Gregory and Vigilantius. The Greek and Latin equivalents of watchful ones. The reason was not because they liked the sound of the words, but because of its instru the instruction that Jesus gave to us in our text in Mark 13. He told us to be on guard. He told us to be awake, be vigilant, be watching. And what his disciples are to be watching for is his return. That's what we're to be doing every day of our lives. That's the subject of Mark 13. In Matthew's fuller account of the discourse on the Mount of Olives, Jesus was answering the disciples' question, what will be the sign of your coming? So the subject of his lesson in chapter 13 is eschatology. It is the study of future things, the last things, especially his return and the kingdom that he will bring. And his instruction, especially here at the end, is to be alert and watching for his coming because we don't know when it will be and we don't want to be caught unprepared when he comes and inactive. Now, as you think about it, what could keep us more alert and more active in our Christian life 
than knowing that Jesus is coming again. And that He may be coming soon. And what could be more encouraging? We know what the world cannot discover by all of its study and learning. We have the answers to some of the great mysteries of history and of science. What everything is and how it will all end. I have in my notes an old article dated 1993, so it may be a bit out of date by now, but it's about dark matter, about its importance, how it makes up much of the universe and determines the shape of space and time, so they think. But dark matter is invisible. Scientists don't know what it is. Some aren't even sure that it is. But one astronomer was hoping she lived long enough to find out the answer to the question of dark matter. Solving that mystery, she said, will answer questions about the nature and fate of the universe. My greatest fear, she said, is that the solution will be boring. Well, I'm for learning all about dark matter. And while I don't want to be trite, we know the nature of the universe. And I don't mean by that that we can write these papers that are full of mathematical equations and explain it all. But we know what it is. It is created. And Christ holds it together by His power, the apostles tell us. He who created it and holds it all together is going to bring it all to an end someday. It won't be boring. It couldn't be more thrilling. It will be glorious. He's coming again. He promised that. In the last chapter of the Bible, he said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So he's coming, coming again, and he's coming with rewards. That is exciting. And having reassured his disciples that it will happen, he tells them to be on the alert, to keep watch. You don't know when the Master is coming. That's the lesson of this final portion of the discourse. He begins it with a parable about watching. He tells the disciples in verse 28 to learn from the fig tree. It puts forth leaves when summer is near. And just as the, the change in foliage indicates the change of season, so too the signs that he has given, that he's been speaking of here, indicate the nearness of his return. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that He is near right at the door. In other words, nature gives us a lesson on why we should be watchful. Just as budding leaves indicate the nearness of summer, so too these signs indicate the Lord's return. Some people, though, have, have given this a more specific interpretation and explained it as a parable about Israel. The fig tree blooming is Israel becoming a state in 1948. In fact, next month they will celebrate their 70th birthday of the modern state of Israel. And it's an attractive interpretation and it has some justification because the Old Testament does speak of Israel in those, those terms. It's been compared to a fig tree. In fact, back in chapter 11, the Lord Himself compared it to a fig tree. Remember, He saw this. They were on their way to Jerusalem. They see a fig tree. He's hungry. He goes to get fruit from it because it has leaves indicating that it's a fruitful tree, but there was no fruit on it. So He cursed the fig tree. That itself is a parable of Israel. It had leaves, as it were, because it had lots of religion, lots of ceremony, but no life. No fruit. So he has referred to Israel in terms of the fig tree, but here that interpretation is unlikely. Luke 21, for example, has a fuller statement of this in which Jesus said, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. So it's not one particular tree that is significant, but trees in general. He makes special mention, though, of the fig tree because it was especially illustrative of the point that he's making. It was a well-known harbinger of spring in the Middle East. It becomes bare in winter, followed by early blossoms, which makes it stand out. 
so that it indicates that winter is ending and spring and summer, summer are coming. So as the leaves of trees indicate the change of seasons, so too the events of history, and particularly the future cosmic events Jesus just described will indicate his return is near. The Lord's point is we are to be anticipating his coming again. We are to be looking for it. We do that in part by paying attention to what's going on around us, to the events of the day. Yet having said that, we, we have to be careful, very cautious about how we interpret the events that we see, just as Jesus warned earlier that we are to be uh, careful about what we hear. We are to be wary and not misled by those who come speaking about prophetic fulfillment, describing the coming of the Messiah, uh, maybe speaking of themselves in that way. He's warned against uh, false ideas that are out there. So the rebirth of Israel as a nation in 1948 is, I think, very significant. Uh, I think it's a, a very important thing, but it's not the fig tree of this parable, and it's not uh, the fulfillment of prophecy. It may be a, um, a prelude to that, though. But the scriptures foretell, foretell the nation being regathered in faith, and that has not yet happened. It won't happen until Christ returns and regathers the people. Israel is still very much in unbelief. We are still in the period of general signs. But the end will come. God is working everything according to His plan. All of the details of, of, of life that go on around us and may seem to have very little relationship to one another or to to anything that we can see, all fit in God's plan, and His plan is being governed by Him and guided and directed to its proper end. And to emphasize the certainty of the glory to come, the accomplishment of that plan, the certainty of it happening, of the Lord's coming, he adds in verse 30, uh, verse 30 that truly this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So he was saying, be assured. All these things will happen as I have said they will happen. And when they do, when they all happen, they will happen quickly. The end will come quickly. But this raises a question about this generation that won't pass away. We wonder which generation is he speaking of there? His generation? The generation of the disciples there before him to whom he spoke? Many people have taken it in that way and they've concluded that the Lord was obviously mistaken. That generation is gone, long gone. But that's an impossible conclusion if we hold to the Lord's deity. And it's not a necessary conclusion. Another explanation is that the all things that will happen before the generation passes away are only those events that uh, lead up to the fall of Jerusalem in uh, A.D. 70. And that would solve the problem, but uh, that creates another problem. It doesn't do justice to the meaning of all things which include the, the, the specific spectacular signs that he has spoken of in verses 14 through 27. The cosmic events that occur that have not yet happened. So if all things includes future things, then it must follow that it is a future generation that won't pass away when they witness those events which will herald the Lord's return. But the Lord's emphasis here is not on the time of His return, but on the certainty of it. Once those final events occur, the end will come quickly and certainly. It won't happen over generations. The present signs that we see, the wars and the rumors of wars, the, the uh, disturbances of various kinds are happening generation after generation. The generation that witnesses 
these final signs, and really in that sense all of the signs together, won't pass away. The end and the Lord will be, as it were, right at the door. Those that are there on earth when this happens will see it, and He will come, and they'll witness that quickly. That's the point the Lord is making. And He confirms that in verse 31. This is not a, a fantasy. This is not some vain hope. Heaven and earth will pass away, He says, but My words will not pass away. Now that's a bold statement. Could you say that? I couldn't say that. My words will never pass away. It's, it's a statement similar to the one that Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. As permanent as the universe seems, the word of the Lord is more permanent. It is truly permanent. In fact, the universe is not permanent. It will dissolve someday. Other of Hebrews says that someday it's going to be folded up like an old garment. But the Word of God never will. It is forever. And that's what Jesus says about His words. They will stand forever. The promises that He makes will not be shaken. They will be fulfilled and fulfilled forever. Now who again can say that? It's tantamount to saying His words are God's words. It's an implicit claim to deity. In fact, it is just that. That's what he is making here. That's what he's saying. And because he is saying that, because he is God, because he is God's Son, very God of very God, his word is true. His promises are reliable. This was the guarantee that our hope, our hope in the Lord's return, is real. And we should rest in that, and we should live with that before us every day, and we should anticipate every day His coming. This is revelation. This is divine revelation. This is what we trust in. Not reason, though divine revelation is completely reasonable and completely logical. But we begin here. We begin with God's Word. The world does not. The world begins with its own ideas, with its own speculation, with skepticism. It never has any certainty of its knowledge. We begin with the Word of God. And Jesus was reinforcing His statements here to give His disciples confidence in what He taught. My words won't fail, He says. But then in verse 32, he gives a word of caution for anyone tempted to read too much into the events of the day and go on to set a date for the Lord's return. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now that statement has troubled Christians. Perhaps it's troubled you. Perhaps it's troubling you right now. And we just talked about Christ being the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. How can Jesus be God and not know something? The reason is because He's also man. He is the God-man. Fully God, fully man. And when He became a man, He submitted to the limitations of humanity. In his human nature, he did not know the date of his return. No one does but the Father alone. Ignorance is not error. And for him, it was part of the humiliation of the incarnation. It involved the, the self-limitation of his knowledge. In his human nature, he depended on the Father for his development, and for his leading and for his knowledge. He says that in John chapter 5. And specifically, you read that in verse 30. He doesn't seek his own will, but the will of the Father. He does what he sees the Father doing. He followed his leading. He was truly one of us and lived as we are to live. He didn't have an edge 
on us. Now, he was without sin, that's true. But he was a genuine man with a true body and a reasonable soul. He was not a person with a divine human nature, a deified human nature. This is one of the issues that the early church struggled with. But the, the nature of Christ or the two natures of Christ, how do they fit in the one person of Jesus Christ? And one of the solutions was, well, it's a mix of two natures, human and divine. But that is not a human like we are. That's not a human being. That's more of a demigod. That's more of a Hercules or something like that. In fact, it was a pagan notion. He was a genuine man who had to look to the Father at every step of his human life, just as we do, so that in his human nature, he knew only what the Father revealed to him. And that was true there on the Mount of Olives. For us, though, and to the point, this gives a warning that if only the Father knows the date of his return, then certainly we don't and we can't. We can't know that. We're to be aware of the signs of the age, but beware of dates. And yet, that has been very difficult for men to do. Every generation has the sense that, that it is the important generation. We think of the previous generations, and we like to read about them and study about them if we like history. But we're the generation that's here. This is the real thing. And we can't help but feel, or people can't, that perhaps this is the final generation, the last generation. That's very common in every generation. Years ago, I was in the home of family friends in Holland. The husband of the couple was the head of the English department at the Free University of Amsterdam. We were in his study, and he pulled off the shelf a collection of sermons by the Archbishop of York that were preached a thousand years ago. And so they were in Old English, which is like another language, and the professor translated a few lines from one of the sermons. He just took it at random and began translating this. It was a sermon preached during the, the Viking raids on the English coast, which were terrifying. In fact, there's a, a famous prayer that is supposed to have come from that age. From the fury of the Norsemen, good Lord, deliver us. And the sermon of the archbishop had that that fear and apocalyptic outlook in it. It began with the archbishop warning that the world is near its end. This is the end. Well, many people in many generations have thought that. Early in the Reformation, Martin Luther was convinced that the papacy would crumble, the Jews and Turks would be converted, and Christ would return. We don't need to be reminded of all the modern cases of date setting. Here's what we know. No one knows when Christ is coming. It's hubris, it's, it's arrogance, and it's sin to set a date. But we know that He is coming. When it happens, men will know it. So, be ready at all times. That's the lesson here. And the importance of doing that, of, of being ready, is underscored, is reinforced with another parable the Lord tells in verses 34 to 36. A man goes away on a journey and he puts his servants in charge of his house. They don't know when he will return, but each one knows his responsibility and is to be continually engaged in doing the things that he's been instructed to do. To the doorkeeper, the master says, stay on the alert. Then the Lord says to his disciples in verse 35, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. To sort of abbreviate those two verses, therefore be on the alert, 
in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. We are like servants in a house. Every one of us. Every one of us has responsibilities. Every one of us has been given gifts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit and He's gifted you with at least one gift, maybe more. But that means all of us have our responsibilities to be engaged in. We're to be, we're to be diligent. Engaged in those activities and alert to our Lord's return. Paul may have had this in mind. In fact, I think he did when he wrote to the Romans, do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. It's the same idea. Wake up. Stay on the alert. Christians can begin to drift. They can begin to, to grow cold to the things of God. It sets in without us even knowing it. The, the daily routine of life does that to us. It lulls us to sleep. We have so many things to do. And there are important things to do. And they have to be attended to. But as we do that, we lose sight of, of the very things that the Lord is speaking of here. So we need to be aware of the dangers that are around us. We need to be aware that the Lord's return is real and it can happen when we're not expecting it. So we're to be aware. We're to be in prayer. And we're to be active in our duties. And knowing that He's coming, being alert to that, and to the signs that, that point to His return is motivation to be diligent in our labors. Look, the... the the signs of, of the age we live in, the, the wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the famines, the all kinds of difficulties, they're general. They go on from generation to generation, but they do signal the Lord's coming in that they, they remind us the world is out of joint. It's not right. It's not the way it's to be. And in order for it to be put right, as it will be, the Lord must return. So whenever we hear of these kinds of things, they remind us, this is not, things are not the way they're to be and the, they're not the way they're going to be. They should remind us daily that the Lord is coming again and should be an encouragement to us to be very diligent in the responsibilities that we have. John Calvin consistently did that, did all three. He was, away, he, he was aware, he was in prayer, and he was active. He worked hard. Toward the end, when friends wanted him to slow down and do less work, he would say, would you have my master find me idle? The Lord's return is a sobering and sanctifying hope. It's a, a doctrine that keeps us alert and active. All of the apostles taught it. In, in view of it, in view of the Lord's uh, coming, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct, Peter asked. Well, the kind of people we ought to be, the sort of people we ought to be, is people who are holy in our conduct. That's the point he's making. And so this affects people. It affected Calvin. He was, he was busy weekly preaching, teaching, writing, organizing the church, defending it against enemies and heretics, and all of this while he was in frail health. Toward the end, he had to be carried into the pulpit to preach. He was so weak. Somebody said, at the age of 55, Calvin literally burned out in the service to God. But he took the Lord's return seriously. If, as Paul said, salvation is nearer than when we believe, then it was nearer 1,500 years later after Paul said it, it's even nearer now 500 years after Calvin. We all want Christ's return. A Christian wants that. But again, modern life makes it difficult to be alert and watching for various reasons, from materialism and all of the opportunities it gives us for distractions to secularism and the doubts that the unbelievers of our age cast upon these great promises we have. The promise of the Lord's return is not taken seriously today. It's dismissed as uh, 
as medieval or uh, a fiction held over from some primitive time in the church, not something that a rational mind would seriously entertain today. But believing in the Lord's return is not at all unreasonable or irrational. We're not looking for some fantastic idea to take place. Just the opposite. The Lord said, my words will not pass away. Do you believe that? He's made great promises here. Do you believe those promises? He's good for His Word. He prophesied this age would have wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes and trouble, and it has. It still does. So His words are true there. He prophesied that He'd be arrested, that He'd be mocked, that He'd be beaten and crucified and resurrected. All of that happened. Over a period of 40 days, over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ, looked at Him, touched Him, talked to Him, ate meals with Him. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6, a group of them watched Him ascend bodily into heaven from the Mount of Olives and were told that He would return again, return in the same way, bodily, physically, actually. There were many eyewitnesses to these things, to these events. Our hope is grounded on documented historical fact. These things are not fiction. The Lord promised He is returning. His Word doesn't fail. So, a wise person will prepare for it and be watchful and be active. That's what His servants do. That's the lesson here. It's not about the rapture of the church. This is about the second coming. This is about the events of Revelation 19 and 20. But in principle, what the Lord teaches here applies to the rapture. It applies to us very much. We are to anticipate it. We are to live expectantly. He is coming again. The world is full of skeptics but the Scriptures are clear. It is true. This is our hope. As I said, the apostles taught it, all of them. The Lord's return is mentioned in every book of the New Testament with the exception of Galatians and 2nd and 3rd John. I haven't counted the number of times that it's mentioned in the New Testament, but I've read that it is mentioned 318 times in 260 chapters. That's a lot, which indicates this is not only true, but it is an important doctrine. The Lord and the apostles put a lot of stress on it. And one reason is it's practical. That is, it's practical if hope is practical. And that hope affects our conduct. That's what Peter said. It's what John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself as, even as he is pure. Well, it's had an effect, a good effect, a sanctifying effect on many. Calvin being one, but the Earl of Shaftesbury being another. He was a, an evangelical social reformer in the 19th century. He worked to improve the living conditions of the working class in England during the Industrial Revolution. Times were very difficult. They were pr prosperous in many ways, but um, there were, uh, it was a, a grind for so many people. He said near the end of his life, I do not think that in the last 40 years I have lived one conscious hour that was not influenced by the thought of our Lord's return. It's quite a statement. So that doctrine moved him into action that led to the improvement of lives from women to children, working in mines and people engaged in all forms of labor. He believed the Lord's promise that he will return. And like Calvin, he did not want his master to find him idle. 
The Lord doesn't want to find us, any of us, idle. And so he ends his lesson to the disciples with a firm warning. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. He began this Olivet Discourse by saying, see to it that no one misleads you. This is another way of saying, be on the alert. That's the keynote of this whole lesson, this whole sermon. It's to be watchful. Don't be deceived by false messiahs or false prophets or false teachers. Don't be lulled to sleep by prosperity. Wake up. Don't drift. Be active. Time may be short. You may not be named Gregory. You may not be named Vigilantius, fortunately. I don't know anyone who is. But you can still be watchful ones. I mentioned Holland earlier. My mother-in-law was from the town of Scheveningen on the coast of the North Sea. It was a fishing town. Men would go out in ships to fish for herring and eel and all the things that they like in Holland. It was a dangerous job. The North Sea is an unforgiving place. And you can imagine the longing the wives of those fishermen had uh, for their safe return. There's a bronze statue there on the shore of a woman in a traditional Dutch costume standing looking out to the sea as a memorial to the wives of fishermen who for generations would stand there daily on the shore looking for the ships and the return of their husbands. That's a good picture of the church, the bride of Christ. We are to be longing for His return. We don't worry that He may not return, but we're to be watching for Him. That's what He tells us to do. He promised, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what He has done. That should make you and me zealous to be doing things for Him, serving Him to be active. We don't want Him to find us idle. So, as Jesus said, take heed, keep on the alert, or as Paul said, awaken from sleep. May the Lord help us to do that. May His grace put us on the alert and make us watchful. And if you have not believed in Him, if you're here without Christ, our invitation to you is very simple. Come to Him. How do you do that? You believe in Him. You put your trust in Him. Look to Christ while you have the opportunity to do that. He receives everyone who comes to Him. Everyone who trusts Him. That's the way of escape. He's coming again as we read here. He's coming as a judge. But He can forgive because the first time He came, He came as a sacrifice. And through His sacrifice for the sins of men, he gives salvation to all who believe. So, come to Him. He receives all who do. May God help you to do that and help all of us who have done that to have this perspective to know that the end is coming someday in God's will according to His plan and we're to be looking for His Son, looking for His coming. It may be soon. But why don't we end with a hymn? Let's stand and sing. Hymn number 303 in the Red Book, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 303. Father, we praise You as the governor of history. We're told in Hebrews chapter 1 that Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is carrying the ages along. He's guiding and directing history. It's all moving toward a glorious end. And someday you will tell your son to return and he'll come in glory and with his reward. So Father, may we be a people watching and waiting. Pray that you'd stir us up to do that and in so doing, be active in serving you. 
We thank you for the service you've done, you've done for us. We thank you for your son's service for us in becoming our sacrifice. It's in his name we pray. Amen.